Psalm 73. It's a long psalm of 28 verses. And the Lord help us to study this within one hour that we have. <clears throat> now this is the third section of the book of Psalms. This is the first psalm in the third book of Psalms. As you can see in the title, Psalm 73 is a psalm of Asaph or Asaph. A group of psalms attributed to Psalm uh, to Asaph characterize this section of psalms. Psalm 73 to 83 are attributed to Asaph. Who was Asaph? Well, Asaph was a choir leader. He was a Levite. And according to 1 Chronicles chapter 6, and according to 1 Chronicles 15, Asaph was one of the leaders of music whom David himself appointed. And that's incredible because we know David was a wonderfully talented man when it comes to spiritual songs, hymns and psalms. He has invented many musical instruments. David was extremely musical. To have David to appoint someone to the leadership of music department of the Old Testament worship service. is a great honor. And it tells us that Asaph was very musical as well. But more than just a musician, he was also a psalm writer. We have seen other psalms also written by him. For example, Psalm 70, uh, uh, I mean, uh, Psalm, let me see, suddenly I can't recall the number. No, uh, Psalm 50, that's right. Psalm 50 was written by him. We have seen it before. But in this section, Psalm 73 to Psalm 83, we notice that he is writing a tremendous number of psalms that make me think that he was not only inspired by God, just as God inspired David, but was in great fellowship with David in the matters of the worship of God. He was a spiritually matured person. He was one who has received special attention from David. Well, what we read about him in 1 Chronicles chapter 15 goes like this. And David spake to the chief of the Levites to appoint their brethren to be the singers with instruments of music, psalteries and harps and cymbals, sounding by lifting up the voice with joy. So the Levites appointed Haman, the son of Joel, and of his brethren, Asaph, the son of Berechiah, and of the son of Merari, their brethren, Ethan, the son of Cushiah, 
So Asaph was among the three leading men that the Levites have chosen to lead the choir in the house of God. The other two were Haman and Ethan. All these psalms that Asaph written were to be sung in the house of God. We can say they were worship songs for the public worship. Though Psalm 73 is written from a personal perspective of Asaph and is a reflection of Asaph's life as a spiritual man, yet it is reflective of most of us in this world. Psalm 73 is written somewhat like Psalm 37 and 49, where the psalmist struggled with the problem of wicked people flourishing especially as opposed to righteous people. Righteous seem to suffer and the wicked seem to flourish. And this thought is very disturbing, especially when you are the suffering one. Even more, when you are the object of the anger and persecution of the wicked. So here we see Asaph struggling with one big thought. What is really the best thing that I can have in this life? What's the good thing that I can expect from God being a believer? What should be the thing that I should follow after? Dear friends, we are living in a period of the history of the church where religion, particularly Christianity, has become a way to be rich. Today, Christianity has been hijacked by some materialistic carnal men who blatantly say that God calls you to be rich and he wants to be rich. And if you believe in Jesus, of all people, Jesus, you're going to be the richest. Or you're going to be as rich as you like yourself to be. What a person to point to. What a person to be placed before people and say, He is our hero. Jesus Christ. Who gave up all glory in heaven and came to this world. And lived among men as a poor individual. We had no house, we had no great savings, rejected, having no comeliness in his appearance, and his speech was highly offensive. Nobody really cared for him except a few who had been marveled <coughs> at his divine qualities which was reflected in his teachings and in his works. But majority of people who wanted to have a politically minded leader were disappointed. The majority was not at all pleased with Christ because Jesus was not an earthly person. He lived on earth, but he was not earthly. 
His mind was set on the kingdom of God. He talked about kingdom of God. He talked about kingdom of heaven. Basically, those two terms, kingdom of God and kingdom of heaven, refer to the same. He taught people how to live on earth as heavenly people, not as earthly people. And that was a big conflict for those who wanted to be earthly, those who wanted to live as though this world is everything that matters. Whenever people think that we can go to Jesus so that we can enjoy this world, they're going to be disappointed with Christ. And what is shocking to us, as we are going to see in this psalm, even godly men and women are so easily overran by this earthliness, this love for this material world, which, watch this, result in jealousy and envy. Don't be surprised if I were to tell you, if you really want to see jealous and envious people come to church, you and me, we are very jealous of rich and mighty people of this world. We are constantly thinking we must be like them. We must be among them. Only they can entertain us. And so what do we do? A lot of Christians rush to the world. They go and listen to people who teach how to be rich. They take courses, how to invest and make themselves rich. They don't realize they are selling their soul to this world. Because they are trained to entangle themselves by laying up treasures on this earth. And there's another group of Christians. They're not happy with the songs in the church. They are not happy with the content of it. They must go and see who is the lady who came recently? And Singapore got into hot soup. What is that? Taylor Swift. Yeah, thank God she's swift. She left quickly. And I wouldn't be surprised. Some got seven ends already went to watch her. <laughs> you think Jesus went to watch her with you? I'm going to say this again in the next, because I have this inkling. Some of you were <laughs> Taylor Swift. Something is wrong with your thinking. I have to say this. Why? Because, dear friends, we have to wake up from our spiritual slumber. Let's don't envy these things. Love not the world. Because you, without realizing, even though you are a spiritual person, even though you are a faithful Christian, you can get stuck in the world, if you let your heart envy the material world. Are you ready? You're going to see what materialism can do to a soul. Even though you're a believer. And I hope you will never be in that state. May God help us. Pastors can be in this situation. Elders can be in this situation. Young Christians can be in this situation, but we must jolt ourselves out of it. Ready. So we're going to see there is no greater good than God, as Asaph explains it to us. How did he come to that conclusion? Well, first of all, he says, without a doubt, in verse 1, truly God is good. Not just that God is good. I mean, if God is good, what does it matter? He's good. But he says God is good to Israel. God is good to his people. Even to such as are of a clean heart. You know, you cannot understand the goodness of God if you don't have a clean heart. 
If your heart is full of sin, if your heart is fully full of greed, jealousy and envy, covetousness, you can't see the goodness of God. You want idols that will serve your heart's unclean, impure desires. Oh, let's pray. Lord, cleanse my heart that I may see thy goodness and rejoice. We all agree God is good, right? We sing, God is so good. God is so good. God is so good. He's so good. That's very important. To me. We let our children sing this song. Make them sing. But sing from your heart. Otherwise, they forget this. They think the world is good. Taylor Swift is good. Great men of wealth are good. We're going to lose our way. Sing that song like Asaph teaches. God is good. Is good to Israel. Whom the Lord has called. But not all Israel are true Israel. Who are the true Israelites? Those are, who are of clean heart. Those who accept their sins and seek God's forgiveness. Being cleansed by him. Being sanctified by his spirit and word. We learn to move away from uncleanness of this world. You know, dear friends, if you do not seek the cleanliness of your heart, you are going to be corrupt. And you will not see the goodness of God. Because you are going to be blinded by carnality and materialism. That you look away from your God. If God is the perfect good. As there is this Latin phrase that says. Summum bonum. The great good that he is. Would we take our eyes from him? I mean. We like to look at pretty things. Good things. Marvelous things. If your heart is convicted that God is good. And he is good to me. You would never want to take your eye away from him. He's so good. He's so good to me. Sometimes when I ask young people who come to me and say, Pastor, I'm now in a relationship. I ask them, why? I've not asked everyone here. I should ask everybody soon. Why? Normally they try to convince me by saying, oh, oh, if it's a young man, he would tell me, oh, she's very humble, very God-fearing, and she's very good pastor. Well, sometimes I smile in my heart whether the person would say the same thing after two years or after five years. But anyway, that's what they say. And they are full of this young lady they are, you know, so taken by them. And if I were to try and tell them, you know, I need to warn you about this person. Wow. That, even I'm scared to say it because it would change their uh, thoughts toward me. Wow, this pastor is so critical. They don't want to hear the truth. Because they somehow feel that this is the best choice. Now why did I say this? To tell you how much a person can be attracted to someone whom they think is really good. And in human relationships, we even forget about people's weaknesses because we are attracted to some aspects of that person. But when we have God who is perfectly good, in whom there is no darkness, no evil, perfect goodness. And he not only appeared to be good, he is really good because he shows his goodness to us. He's good to Israel. Now, even if we are all wicked people, 
who have no desire for God, he has not done against us as we deserve. In his goodness, he showed pity, mercy, and compassion to us. Isn't that right? And yet we cannot see his goodness. You know how seriously flawed you and I are? That we are not so convicted that the Lord is good? Now this is how we get distracted from the perfect goodness of our God. Watch this. What we see from verse 2 to 3 is the way in which Asaph moves away from God. Verses 2 and 3. But as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped, for I was envious at the foolish when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Though he said God is good, and God is good to Israel, that includes Asa, he suddenly says, as for me, my feet were almost gone. My steps had well nigh slipped. He is slipping away from the good Lord whom he has come to know. He is standing in a slippery slope, sliding constantly into a huge pit from which he can never climb. And he is frightened by his present situation. He says, as for me, my feet were almost gone. It's like a person loses footing in a slippery slope and then start uh, swift sliding. Scary. Almost in that deadly situation. And he says the reason is because I was envious at the foolish. Verse 3. When I saw the prosperity of the wicked. Dear friends, this is not only an intellectual problem, but it is also a spiritual problem that Christians get into. The moment your mind started to think in a worldly, materialistic, carnal way, you're not going to be safe in the presence of God. Because in the presence of God, there is no room for mammon. There is no room for covetousness. You cannot serve God and mammon at the same time, as Jesus said in Matthew 6. Everyone who has his heart fixed on the wealth of this world will have a backsliding nature within him. We must admit, okay, dear friends, please. Uh, please don't think I'm against someone who is becoming rich. If the Lord bless him with wealth, blessed be his name. But, dear friends, even though you're wealthy, or you are poor, I must say, don't admire the things of this world. You see, if you think only the poor will have such envy toward the rich, you are wrong. The rich have greater greed. <laughs> when they make their first million, they say, when will I be a multimillionaire, right? When they become a multimillionaire, they say, when can I be a billionaire? They are constantly in this race to be richer. Nobody say, I have enough. Very few. Praise God for such you can say. Well, there is one group that say, I have enough. Because they are lazy. They don't want to work. They want to live on the father's savings. They want to live on the inheritance they receive. They never put their hand to work. Even though you have inherited wealth, you must be a hardworking person. Six days you must work, God commanded. 
And if you don't need all of it, give to the poor. Why don't you help the others? Why don't you help the church? Why don't you help the mission stations? Why don't you help the poor? You don't waste your opportunities that God gave you. Work hard. Earn as much as God teach you to earn. But never be a materialistic, carnal individual who loves the things of this world. Dear brethren, now we see from verses 4 to 11, a description of the wicked. So, his mind is taken away from God into these people's lives and their wealth. And he then explains how he sees them. Verse 4 to 11. For there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. There, there are no bands in their death, but their strength is firm. In other words, there is nothing that seems to overcome them. They have no real struggles in life. They are strong. They are healthy. They seem to flourish. Nothing is sort of bringing them down to the face of death. Verse 5. They are not in trouble as other men. Neither are they plagued like other men. Well, I don't need to explain a lot. They seem to be doing better and better. They are better off than most people. Verse 7. I'm sorry, verse 6. Therefore pride compasseth them about as a chain. Violence covereth them as a garment. They are very proud. To the point he says they... Their necklace is made of pride. The chain around the neck is pride. Of course, some wealthy people like to wear gold around their neck, right? They like to even unbutton the shirt to show the thick necklace around their uh, neck. And of course, if, if, if it's a lady... And she would like to wear diamond studded necklaces or whatever to show that they are wealthy. It's very common, even in ancient days. And not only that, pride leads to violence, according to verse 6. You know, they are so proud that they do not regard others with respect. If anybody is in the way, they will thrash them. They don't care how others are feeling or how others are treated. They just want their way. They are so powerful. They are go-getters. They will not entertain anyone who apparently competing with them. They will suppress them. They will destroy them. They are violent for themselves. I mean, for their own success in life. And then, he continues in verse 8. I'm sorry, verse 7. Their eyes stand out with fatness. They have more than heart could wish. <laughs> they never thought they can make it to such great wealth. And they are so wealthy that their eyes stand out with fatness. That's a Hebrew idiomatic expression to talk about a person who is so rich and wealthy. And they have eyes full of things that they desired. Everything that they wanted, they have it. And then, verse 8, they are corrupt and speak wickedly concerning oppression they speak loftily. They're corrupt. They know how to turn the righteous cause of some into an opportunity to make a name for themselves or make wealth for themselves. They know how to turn 
the governments for themselves. They use their wealth to bring in corruption within the society. You know, wealth can be a quick way to corrupt any man or any nation. A pastor whose heart is fixed on money will be a corrupt man. If he's desiring money all the time, you know he will not stand up for Christ. He will not stand up for the truth. He will not stand up for holiness within the church. He will be a corrupt man. He will entertain corruption. He will use the Bible. He will use the name of Jesus. He will talk about holiness, but he will ne never stand up for it. They are corrupt. And this will be also true in the society, in governments and so on. So we are told here that these materialistic persons are corrupt and they speak wickedly concerning oppression. In other words, they have no sympathy to the oppressed and they would say, well, they deserve it. And they laugh at the oppressed And they speak loftily. Verse 9. They set their mouth against the heavens. And their tongue walketh through the earth. But they are so arrogant. That they even. Speak blasphemously. Blasphemously. Against God. In verse 11 actually. He says. That they say. How doth God know. And is their knowledge. In the most high. Well verses 9 and 10 told us. That they speak against God. And their people. Angrily. Behave. In oppression. They think a mighty lot about themselves. And they are not kind hearted. They are rude. They're violent. They wreck the peace of others just to have their way so they can succeed. Now, don't envy these people, please. Don't envy these people. Look. Look at what they said concerning God. Verse 11. They say, how does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Dear brothers and sisters, when people become so wealthy and God leave them to their pursuits without interruption, they would say, oh, what can God do? God cannot do very much against us. Early this morning, I was taking some time to get my mind focused on the message and suddenly I had a, a WhatsApp message that came through from a friend of mine in India. It was about the deep suffering of a pastor in one of the northern states of India. Uh, he came, he went to north of India from the state that I am in the south. And he went all the way with his wife to serve in villages, which are very backward. Most people have no education. They are looked down by the rich ones in the part of the world. And they are sort of destined to live all their life in poverty. But Christians are the ones who go in and teach them how to read, how to write, and slowly, through reading and writing, and listening to the Bible, they, 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 they develop a, a, a mental perception that, hey, actually God wants us to thrive. Uh, not that they are going to be materialistic, but at least they realize they are not to be always in this, uh, in this dire state that they have been. They think because they are born in this particular 
tribe or clan and the parents were uh, slaves or servants to the richer ones and they have to be always like that. But when Christians goes in and educate that society with the gospel and with necessary skills of this life, you know, they desire to work, they desire to break away from uh, their miserable condition and some of the rich ones won't be happy. And you know who they look for? The missionaries, the preachers. So this particular man who was in the video was so badly beaten. And I look at the beating. I felt so breathless. Ruthless behavior. You know, one of them, one of the persecutors shouted at the preacher and said, Ha! Where is your God? See whether he can save you from us. How I wish that that moment the Lord will come through the skies and kill them all. <laughs> or at least snatch this man away from the cruel hand. God didn't do that. God left this man to be beaten almost to death. Even though police who came later rescue him from near death situation. He says in that video he dread to go back to that place. He left everything that he had, not a lot. Whatever he had, he had a motorbike that he used to go around and preach the gospel. And all these things he left. He's a poor man. And dear friends, there are so many believers who go through this. And when they see the wealthy people, when they hear their mocking of God, and then in pride they persecute these believers, the believers become extremely confused in the mind. And so, as he says in verse 12, which is a summary of all that he said about the rich ones. Behold, these are the ungodly who prosper in the world. They increase in riches. This is his struggle. The ungodly prosper in the world. They increase in riches. I hope you underline that, okay? Just because you are increasing in wealth, it doesn't mean you are, you are spiritually uh, uh, yeah, progressing or spiritually growing. The ungodly. I'm not also saying that the, uh, that the godly would not abound. Yes, the godly can grow, but in this situation, majority of Christians and believers will have this struggle. How is God permitting people who have been speaking against him to become rich and powerful? And how is it that the Lord is allowing we who love him to suffer under these wicked people? It's a big struggle in most believers mind. So what do most Christians do in today's world? They would say, ah, let me have a compromise situation. And they nowadays use a very nice term. Let's ba have a balanced life. This is one word I don't like at all in Christian's life. People often ask me how to balance, how to balance between church and work. How to balance between church and family. How to balance between giving and saving. How to balance between loving my wife and loving my parents. Everything they want to balance. The Bible never says go and balance. All that the Bible says, do the will of God.
If God wants you to work and earn, you work and earn. And if God wants you to give, you give. You remember when the rich young ruler came to Jesus, Jesus never condemned him for having wealth. Jesus didn't say, oh, this wealth you got is not yours. He never said that the rich young ruler grabbed or robbed somebody to become rich. Jesus never rebuked him for his wealth. But Jesus rebuked him for what? Loving the wealth more than God. So Jesus said, let me test you. You are very proud that you didn't steal because he said, I keep all the commandments. So Jesus said, well, then show it that you keep all the commandments. If you call me good, that's what he said to Jesus when he came to Jesus, oh, good master. So Jesus said, why do you call me good? There's only one that is good. That's God. So if you really think I'm good, then let me tell you something. Sell everything, give to the poor and follow me. There ends his adoration of a good Lord. He leaves Jesus. He broke the very first commandment, even though he claimed he kept all the commandments. That thou shalt have no other God. You see, this is the same struggle you are seeing here. But the only difference is that in this case, Asaph is a godly man. In the story that, uh, that I just mentioned to you about the rich young ruler came to Jesus, that rich ra ra young ruler was only pretentious in his love for God. But Asaph was a real believer. So I want you to keep this in mind. In a church, you have both group of people. These are true believers who struggle with materialism. And there are unbelievers, like the rich young ruler, who say, I am doing everything right and having no love for God. And they leave Christ. Christ has no say over their hearts. They will serve the Lord according to their convenience. Let me try. If I can, I will come. Let me see how much I can give you. Instead of saying, yes, the Lord said, I must worship the Lord. I must not forsake the assembling of saints. I must give generously, generously, and sacrificially. They don't think that way. They don't think about what God demands of them. They always think about what is convenient because they want to have a balanced life that they wouldn't become too poor. God will not have sovereignty over their lives. Money will have sovereignty over their life. So I want you to see this. Yeah, Hazaf is a godly man who really believes God is good, but troubled by the prosperity of the wicked. And it confuses him how is that the prosperity of the wicked causes them to be blasphemous and oppressive. While we who love God who is good, suffering so much, even from the hands of these wicked ones. Now he couldn't have a solution in his mind and something amazing happened by the providence of God let's look at this change that's happening here now the change began with God allowing Asaph to fall into a spiritual depression suddenly he falls into a very Sad, depressed condition. Look at verse 13. Verily, I have cleansed my heart in vain and washed my hands in innocency. For all the day long I have I been plagued and chastened every morning. You see this? He was in a dire state of being plagued and chastened, meaning afflicted. Every day he wake up with a heart beaten down, a heart punished. Because he says, I've been keeping myself pure. 
I paid attention to my sanctification. I deliberately kept my hands away from all kinds of crime and guilty deeds. I came clean before the Lord. But in vain did I do this. Oh, what a sad state. He almost thought at this moment, life has no meaning as a believer. You know, dear friends, this is the truth. Whenever Christians take away their eyes from God and put upon unbelieving people who are prospering because of their pursuit of this world, they feel depressed. And that's true about me. If I'm going to think about pastors who are rich, pastors who are doing well, I can be depressed. About five, six years after my graduation from Forreston Bible College, I met with some of fellow graduates uh, for a lunch. And we were sitting in a hawker center and eating. And almost all of us are rather poor uh, compared to others. I specifically remember one particular man joined by two others in that, around that lunch table, suddenly become very upset with all the pastors who have bigger churches and doing well. And they went like this. I'm not quoting verbatim, but the summary of what they said is like this. These pastors, they are so wealthy. Why can't they help us? Why can't they help us to have a better salary? Why can't they send some gifts to us? Why can't they send their people to join us? And I was silent. I, I felt very embarrassed when I heard that. Why are we expecting money from others? In fact, the man who is speaking against a pastor who is doing well by the grace of God has been supported by that church and that pastor. But he wants more. Why should it be? It's not the right thing to do. We must go to God in prayer. That pastor has shown him how to serve the Lord and has been supporting him. But he is also supporting many others. And you can't expect constant money flowing from that pastor to you. Right or wrong, you shouldn't be complaining against other pastors who are doing well. You should go to God and say, Lord, bless me too, that I may do God's will. And I can sincerely say, those who are so jealous have not flourished. That's my experience and observation. You must, have, you must learn to accept your particular situation allowed by God's providence. It may be tough. It may be hard. But remember the first statement that Asaph made. The Lord is good to Israel and that of a clean heart. Never forget that. Your situation on earth is not relative to anybody else. You stand in relationship with God. You honor God in your heart. You exalt Him in your heart. You magnify Him as a good God. Don't you become depressed in the presence of God. You must be happy, Christian. You must be a contented Christian. Godliness with contentment is great gain in life. But when you compare yourselves with others, oh, he has a car, he has a house, I'm living in a rented house, oh, here, you know, my children have no big school to go to. If that's the case, you will never serve God because God may want you to go to a poor country and be a missionary and your children may have to grow without going to elite schools. You will never accept it because you are the God of your own heart and destiny. It's dangerous. 
We cannot be a Christian like this. We cannot live a life that is com in comparison with the rest of the world. It will bring us to spiritual depression where you cannot think in the right way. And look at this, continuing verse 15. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. Now, he suddenly seemed to have a, a spark in his head. I'm sure the Lord is giving him some thoughts. If he's going to speak the way he has been speaking, he will offend the generations to come. If I say I will speak thus, behold, I should offend against the generation of thy children. If I were to come to the church and speak jealous in a jealous way, in an envious way, this church will soon be full of jealousy and envy toward the world. And you will get attracted to the world. If you speak before your children, with a materialistic heart, with admiration for the things of this world and not for God, it will offend your children. Oh, may God awaken our spirit and say, I cannot speak these thoughts. It may be in my heart. It should never come out of my mouth. A godly man's fear. We have uttered too many things that are unhelpful in our homes. We spoke a lot of things in favor of the world and worldly people before our children, which offend our children. May God deliver us from that mistake. Verse 16 and 17. Here comes a real change, a turning point, a paradigm shift, a radical change in the mind. What's that? Verses 16 and 17. When I thought to know this, it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then understood I their end. He said, I was slipping into a painful situation of life. I was so bitter, I was so envious, and I know my thoughts are not good. If I were to air it, if I were to speak these things, it would distract the generations away from God. You see, this is how faith rebukes oneself. Do you know this? Faith leads you to a conflict against yourself. You cannot be a believer. And not at war against yourself. A believer is in constant war with his own desires, will, and pleasure. Not my will, O oh God, but thine be done. You will say, what a shame I'm thinking like this. This is not what I heard of God. This is not what I read in the scriptures. And he says, when I went into the sanctuary, then understood I their end. What do you see in the house of God? What do you see in the sanctuary? You hear the word being read. You hear the goodness of God, the righteousness of God. You understand his promises. You understand the challenges God's people will face in this earth. And yet, God is good. And in the sanctuary in the olden days, they see... The altar. They see the fire. Consuming the animal. That is laid upon it. The fire represents God's wrath. Against sins of people. And the animal sacrifice represents Christ. Who took the wrath of God against. That was against us. The wrath of God against our carnality, our defiance of God, our rebellion of God. The fire is burning in the temple. But there the, he sees God's grace 
fully manifested in the promise of Christ, who is the Lamb of God, that taketh away the sin of the world. He realized there is no greater goodness than God. Dear brethren, I'm glad you're here in the morning. I'm glad you brought your kids here. And I hope you will make a commitment before God. If you want a paradigm shift for your family, for yourself, be found in the sanctuary of God. Bring up your children in the house of God. David said, I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever and ever. And I want to say this. You yourself, not, don't just be a Sunday Christian. Forsake not the assembling of the saints. Come for fellowship meetings. Come for prayer meeting. It's for who? It's for who? For believers. That we may be sanctified in our hearts. That God may cure our spiritual depressions. I'm not talking about an ungodly man. And I'm not talking to ungodly people. I'm talking to you as Christians. I'm your pastor. I've baptized you. I receive you into the fellowship. I minister to you every Lord's Day. Dear brothers and sisters, like you, I too struggle against sin. I too have jealousy and envy toward the world. But I can only find a destruction of those evil thoughts within me in the presence of God. When I hear his word, when I rejoice in the truth of God's word, when I see him in great authority and majestically speaking with clarity, and I hear him saying, come and be separate. I realize my heart has been in admiration and fellowship with the wicked ones too long. I must sanctify myself so that I will look at God. Now, dear friends, from this turning point, you see a sudden ascent, a sudden change toward God. He was slipping, remember? He said, my feet almost slipped right at the beginning. And now he's coming back. In the sanctuary of God, in the presence of God, there was a change in his mind. And watch this change that's happening, starting with verse 18. Surely thou didst set them in slippery places. Thou castest them down into destruction. Uh, he suddenly says, Lord, yeah, they may be flourishing, but they are not going to be rescued by their money. Their destruction is sure. You are angry toward their materialism. You are angry through, uh, toward them because of their idolatry. They are wicked. They are ip they are oppressive, they are not reverential, they are everything but godly. And to the godly, God says he will destroy them. Dear friends, there's something that I want you to know. In today's world, it is quite fashionable, especially even in modern churches, to say, God loves you all. Good to see you in the sanctuary is going to make you greatly blessed today no in the sanctuary of God God draws a line between those whom he will preserve for eternal blessings and those whom he will cast away into eternal destruction God is a just God you don't sit there disinterested in the things of God if you are disinterested in God you will be overtaken by the world and you will be among those who will be destroyed. Let that be clear in your heart. You cannot be in the presence of God, listen to his word and go out and admire a people who are marked out for destruction because of their sins. Don't admire them. Their destruction is sure. Their prosperity is nothing but a sign of the great destruction that comes upon it. You know, in Romans chapter 9, Paul asked, Why did God raise Pharaoh up to such great height that he was so full of power, so wicked to, 
to, to, to, to afflict Israel until they cried to God. Why? Why did God make Pharaoh so high? So that he may know God is greater than him. His wealth, his power is nothing. God made him get drowned in the Red Sea. You remember that? So just because the wicked rises up in this world, do not admire it. It is a great height from which they fall. The higher you climb, the harder you fall. Great is the destruction of those who reject God and seek the world. And we cannot admire them. We cannot be in their company. Thousands and millions may clap hands. They may all come with ears to listen to their voice. One sentence from their mouth is, can change the market everywhere. Stock market will go up or come down when they speak. But do not be admirers of those people. Because your God is greater. And he will judge them. And so here we go. Verse 19. You see his change. The believers change. Asaph's change toward God. How are they brought into desolation in a moment? They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awaketh. So, O Lord, when thou awakest, thou shalt despise their image. So he says, O God, now it makes sense to me. You are angry toward them. Their wealth is no sign of your approval. Their prosperity and their oppression is not because you are pleased with them. You will destroy them. They are destined for destruction. God will not change his word. God will not fail to judge the world. You better fear the Lord and depart from evil. Verse 21. Thus my heart was grieved and I was pricked in my reins. So foolish was I and ignorant. I was as a beast before thee. He admit his sins. The awareness of truth of God brings us to humility and repentance. A new awareness of himself. Here, a believer, one who is chosen to write songs for worship in the temple. One whom God has used for the nourishment of God's people. Suddenly becomes aware of his spiritual defilement. Look at that. Pastors. Preachers, elders, long-time Christians, listen. Listen what Aesop says about himself. This is, not a, this is not the state of being before conversion. This is a state of being as a mature man. Every spiritual man's heart is full of conflict. Faith, fight against himself. And he says, on my own, <laughs> I'm pricked. So foolish was I, ignorant. I was as a beast before God. You know, dear friends, we are like stubborn bullocks who will not go with the master. When the master says, come this way, you pull back with all your strength. You are a black, backsliding heifer. You want to go the way of the world. You want to admire the world. You Christian parents, many of you are guilty pointing your children to all the worldly people. Look at them, look at them, look at them. And you say, no, they're Christians, you know. But what kind of Christian? Money-minded Christian. Say, you must be like them. You must be like them. I know of a mother who told the children, you know, don't embarrass me when I go to church. Huh? You better be the top in the, in, the, in the school so I can be the proud mother. What an embarrassment. You fit, not God's house. You fit the worldly places. In God's house, yes, our children must work out without a doubt. But it is not they being the, in the top level that make us happy as Christians. Our greatest concern must be we and our children will serve the Lord. Don't just say it for fashion. Don't just hang the words of Joshua on the wall. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. But you are serving 
the world. Let it be real, my friends. This is not a joke. This is reality. You, please, don't be like the rich young ruler. But be like Asaph. If you have backslided, may this be the day. You say, I've been in the sanctuary. And I understood. I was like a beast. Not admiring my God. But ad admiring the things of this world. Caused me to repent. May God grant all of us repentance. We must repent. No delay. No delay, dear friends. Because once you make one step in the wrong direction, you may not hear any more voice of God. And I can tell you this, and as a testimony, and as a pastoral experience, there were parents, and I have to say this very clearly, who push their children to do well in the world to the point they don't care whether they come for youth fellowship or come for retreats or anything. Those are less important. And give all kinds of excuses. You know, when they go to the world, the voice of God is not dealing with them. He lost the kids. They're gone. That's why I'm telling you, when Taylor Swift come, don't let the children go there. You won't hear God's voice. You hear satanic voices. Not only, I have nothing against Taylor Swift as a person. I don't know what she's doing. I mean, if she's doing wicked things, I'm against her. She didn't do any harm to me. Then why am I saying it? Because dear, she is the epitome of that which is carnal and worldly. That which is unrighteous and ungodly. I can't believe Gethsemanes will be in this kind of places after hearing God's word. But I can also understand the temptation is there. What shall I pray? Lord, deliver our church from this dire situation. We are becoming beastly. We are becoming like stubborn heifers. Oh, deliver us. Verse 23, a new awareness about God and an ascend toward God. Beautiful statements here from a man who repents and turns to God. He says, no greater good than God. No greater, than, no greater good than God. It is enough for me to be with God. And serve him. Look at the way he says it. Starting with verse 23. Nevertheless I'm continually with thee. Thou hast holden me by my right hand. Lord. I'm continually with me. Because you hold me by my right hand. You didn't give me up yet. It's like a father. Seeing the son want to run across the road. It's so dangerous. This little boy is going to run. But the father holds his hand. If the father didn't hold. He might dash across. And get hit. Does that illustration help you? He says I'm with you. Because you hold me. You hold my right hand. You won't let me go. Thank you Lord. i almost gone. But you held me up. Your hand was holding me. Verse 24. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel. And afterward receive me to glory. Yes. 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 No matter what be. Our suffering on this earth. He will receive us into glory. A glory that money cannot buy. The wealth of this world shall perish. Only that which is reserved for us in heaven will be undefiled. Shall be incorruptible. All the rest of the things surely will perish. And so he says in verse 25. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. Oh, he is so drawn to God. And he sees God as good, as faithful, as merciful, righteous. Holding his right hand from heaven. And he says, whom shall I desire on earth but thee? If you come to worship God. 
when you go out of this place, you will say, thank you, Father, for calling me to your presence. And I've seen your love in Christ for me. And still willing to forgive and restore me. May my ways be always in your presence. Lead me by thy right hand. Guide me. Don't let any man this world ever take my mind. Because you can die tonight. You can die tomorrow. But make sure you are in heaven, in glory. Money cannot guarantee that. The world's prominent people cannot help you. Only God, through his Son, can guarantee you heaven's glory. So don't be guided by the world. Make sure you follow. Remember Jesus said, follow me. He will guide me. Guide me till I reach that glory land. Whom have I in heaven but thee? There is none upon earth that I desire beside thee. My flesh and my heart faileth, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. In this world, my body is weak, my heart is failing, I don't know how to think. But, O oh God, in your sanctuary I met you, your word has spoken to me, and therefore I shall say, God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. I don't want to worry about myself. I don't want to think that I'm losing my life because I'm not in the same standard with many others around me. I may not be as rich as others. I may not be as prominent as others. I may be despised by them. I may be even in the oppressed class of people. But I have my God. He is my strength. I will not let my heart pursue the things of this world. I will rest with my Lord. For lo, they that are far from thee shall perish. Thou hast destroyed all them that go a whoring from thee. Watch that. A whoring from thee. This is about Israel. Israel is God's people. God is the husband. The Lord is the husband of Israel. When Israel go after the things of this world and start worshipping money and idols, they go a whoring. This is not about unbelievers. This is about those who have come into the covenant community of God. This is about the church. God will not call the world a whore. But God will call the church that has gone after the world a whore. A harlot. A prostitute. A strange woman. An unfaithful. Will Gethsemane be among the whores? But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all thy works. <laughs> it is good for me that I draw nigh to the Lord who is good to Israel. What is the ultimate good? What is the good that you seek after? There is no greater good. That you can have. Than our God. The Lord is good. Jesus said. I am the good shepherd. He is our good savior. Good shepherd. He will guide us. All the way to glory. 